Good morning, church, on this third Sunday in Advent. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Get your Bibles out and turn to the third chapter of John's Gospel, if you will. And while you're turning there, let's begin with prayer. Father, we come to you again this morning with our Bibles open before us, praying that you would enlighten us and fill our hearts with your Spirit. May your word continue to transform us more and more into the image of your Son, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Lily Harley was an actress, a singer, a dancer, who performed in the music halls of London's East End since the time that she left home at the age of 16. She desperately wanted to make the leap to the big stage in the West End and become a serious and well-paid actress. But one night, while performing at the Aldershot, a well-known music hall, her voice cracked. It was so bad that the audience booed her off the stage as her five-year-old son, Charles, watched in the wings. In fact, he finished the performance for her to rousing cheers and money being tossed up on the stage. Lily never recovered. And in fact, her life spiraled downward after that due to the effects of neurosyphilis on her body. She went mad and suffered crushing and debilitating headaches. But Charles only got better and better. In times of mental luc uh, lucidity, Lily taught him everything that she knew. She was proud of her boy, and she harbored no feelings of jealousy or envy as he rose to incredible fame. And if you're wondering who this might be, it might be helpful for you to know that Lily Harley was a stage name for a woman named Hannah Harriet Pedlingham Chaplin. Hannah may, never made it big, but she paved the way for her son, who by now, you've guessed, was Charlie Chaplin. In a much grander and more important way, our gospel this morning begins to shed light on the ministry of Jesus as it expands and the ministry of John the Baptist as it begins to diminish. And what our text clarifies for us this morning is that in God's sovereign plan, John's ministry actually overlapped that of Jesus for a time. In the fourth chapter of Matthew's gospel, you remember that Jesus had been led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. We pick up at verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Verse 12, now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And what I want for you to see is that there was some time that elapsed between verse 11 and verse 12. Time for both Jesus and John the Baptist to be conducting ministry at the same time. The Bible says that John had not yet been put in prison. Now, John had been at the height of his popularity, right? This dirty, bug-eating, camel-hair-wearing rock star from the wilderness was attracting folks from all segments of society. Some people said that he was Elijah incarnate. Herod himself was listening and was fascinated by him. The very man who would put him in prison and chop his head off. And the odd thing is that John's message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not exactly a popular platform, certainly not today. But quoting the prophet Isaiah, he made it clear what his ministry was to be. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. So folks had to be thinking, well, this guy must have something to do with the coming of the Messiah. Now, it's no coincidence that John was associated with the wilderness, in his case, the wilderness of Judea. And you'll remember that it was in the wilderness that God revealed himself to Moses, gave the law, and entered into covenant with Israel. It was in the wilderness where God's people wandered for 40 years before they entered the promised land. The wilderness was where David and Elijah had taken refuge. And it was to the wilderness 
where Jesus had been led away to be tempted. So looking at verses 22 and 23, isn't it ironic to note that it's now Jesus who is conducting his ministry in the Judean wilderness, and while John is in Galilee, north of Judea. The Bible says it was because there was much water there, and I'm sure that was true, but I also think that John had a much nobler intent than getting the water level just right. John knew his place. He clearly understood and accepted his lesser role. He knew how to stay in his own lane, as we would say today. Pastor Alistair Begg once said, there is no ideal place in which to serve God, except in the place in which he sets you down. After the Passover, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, meaning that they left Jerusalem for the surrounding countryside. And Jesus began his preaching and baptizing ministry, although John 4.2 tells us that he didn't personally baptize, only his disciples did. But even as Jesus' ministry was still gaining momentum, large crowds of people were still coming to John and being baptized. All the crowds were beginning to get smaller, to be sure. And John's followers were clearly troubled that their master's popularity was waning. So they come to him in verse 26, and they say, Rabbi, you remember that dude that you were with beyond the Jordan, the one you've been talking about so much? Well, he's baptizing down the road a bit, and everyone's going to him. He's taking all our sinners away. And John fell down and had a hissy fit. No, he didn't. I was just checking to see if you're paying attention. No, he very quietly answered, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. This passage is vital for everyone who seeks to serve the Lord because our society is structured in such a way that we feel compelled to measure our achievements against those of others. But if a man has gifts and talents that are far superior to mine and his ministry, whatever that may be, is having great impact and success, it's because God has given those to him. That's the right way to think about it. Someone may have more education than I do, maybe a lot smarter. That's not hard to do. Maybe a better preacher, teacher, missionary, deacon, evangelizer. But the Bible says a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. Some of you may know that my brother Dan is the pastor of his own church in Crowley, Texas. Dan is a better preacher and teacher than I'll ever be. And you know what? I rejoice in that because I know how great an impact his ministry is having. It's truly blessed by God. At the same time, there's a right way to evaluate our own successes because sadly we have a tendency to play down the successes of others and to uplift our own. If someone is doing well, we say, well, he's just a golden boy, or he just got lucky. But when it's us, we chalk it up to our cleverness, or our intelligence, or just our plain hard work. But the right way to evaluate our own success is to remember that a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, Verse 7, and I love the way that the Living Bible paraphrases it. It says, what are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great? And as though you have accomplished something on your own. F.B. Meyer was a great Baptist preacher and evangelizer in London. And one day, when he was at the top of his game, there came to London a young fellow, 19 years old, and his name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, arguably the greatest preacher who ever lived. And Meyer would stand outside his church and watch as carriage after carriage went by on their way to 
Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. The crowds began to jam into buildings, and they, and they couldn't get a building big enough to hear him preach. And Meyer said, my heart was filled with that old green-eyed monster, jealousy and envy. Here I am preaching in London on a pulpit in my throne, and I've been here these years and years. And that's when he got down on his knees and he said, oh, Lord God, I can't be this way. Take it out of my heart. Take it out of my soul. But later in his life, it happened again. As G. Campbell Morgan overshadowed Meyer's success, when they spoke together at conferences, vast crowds listened to Morgan and then left when Meyer was scheduled to preach. Convicted over his bitter spirit, Meyer committed himself to pray for Morgan, reasoning that the Holy Spirit would not allow him to envy a man for whom he prayed. And God enabled him to rejoice in Morgan's preaching. People heard him saying, have you heard Campbell Morgan preach? Did you hear the message this morning? My God is upon that man. In verse 28, John continues, y'all have heard me say this before, that I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride, he is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, that's me, who stands and hear him rejoices at his voice. My joy is full. And so he compares this unique relationship that he has with Jesus to that of a bridegroom and a friend of the bridegroom. In Hebrew, this person was the shaspen. And he had very specific duties in the planning of the wedding, as well as being the liaison between the bride and the groom. It's kind of like a, a best man today, but with more responsibility. John says it's the bridegroom who belongs to the bride, not the friend. The Shaspen's final act was to guard the bridal chamber and allow only the bridegroom in. And since it was usually dark, the friend would recognize hit the bridegroom's voice and and once the bridegroom was let in, his job was done, and he left rejoicing for his friend. Now, that's a wonderful way to, to view our work. We are satisfied when we do what we are called to do, not how it compares to others and what they are called to do. John the Baptist said he found his fullness of joy in his master's voice. And today we find joy in Christ because as members of the church, we are the bride of Christ. What this tells us today is that the proper attitude toward fellow believers who overshadow our efforts is to share the joy of their accomplishments, just like the friend of the bridegroom, the Shaspen. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. William Carey was known as the father of modern missions for his incredible work in India. But as he lay dying, he turned to a friend and he said, you know what, when I am gone, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's savior. I desire that Christ alone might be magnified. That was the spirit of John the Baptist as well. He must become greater I must become less. My dear friends, so that more and more people may come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, will you pray for my ministry as I pray for yours? Bow your heads with me, please. Father, thank you for placing us where you will so that we might engage in ministry that is productive for the spread of the gospel. May your own actions bring May our actions bring glory to your name. Keep us from all envy and jealousy as we remember that we, all that we have is from you. Help us to rejoice in our brothers and sisters who may do ministry better than we do. Bless us and keep us now, for we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.